Hello, and we are back. So for those that are new uh, to our channel, my name is Grace Nelson. And I'm Charlotte Barrett. And today we're going to be delving deep and discussing the all-important and relevant topic of politics and Black Lives Matter. As we know, race disparity has existed for many centuries, over 400 years, but has recently been brought to the forefront because of the senseless killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and also Armored as well in America. So in today's discussion, Charlotte and I are going to share our experiences, our take on everything that's going on, because it's quite a, a crazy time. A lot of us are feeling anxious, feeling angry. All the emotions are flowing from all of us. So we just really want to, to delve in deep and really hit that on the head during today's discussion. Don't we, Charlotte? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this because it's so relevant for us, particularly, um, you know, as black female business owners and also living in the UK to sort of dispel the myth that this is so far away. It's only in America. It doesn't happen over here. So and it's going to be a great discussion and I think very relevant to all of our entrepreneurs because business politics and society go hand in hand. You can't separate them. You know, one has influence over the other. So I think it's important not to shy away from topics like this and sort of, we want to give our takeaways, our stance and just have a real discussion with you. We'd love for you to drop your comments, um, your viewpoints in the comment section as well. Yes, indeed. So just to kick off with, I'm going to share when I first experienced racism and Charlotte can share hers and then we can really get into the meat of the topic. So I was unaware of racism until the age of about 9, 10. Even then, I, I, I didn't really understand it, to be fair. So 9, 10, I was at my dad's shop in um, the local area and some man came up to me and said to me, what does it feel like to be the N-word? And I had no clue. I'd never heard this word in my life. I had no clue what he was on about. But the way he addressed it, it really startled me. And um, so I went over to my dad and asked him, oh, that man was just talking to me and, and asked me, what does it feel like to be the N-word? And my dad just flipped. He was so furious. And he chased after this guy, shouting, effing and blinding at him. And I thought, shit, you know, whatever this guy has said must be really serious. And I'm trying to recall, but I don't think my dad really explained what the N-word meant. So it was my first initial taster to the world of racism, but I didn't really comprehend what it all meant at that time. But over the years, living in a predominantly white in, um, society, environment, community, uh, going to a predominantly white school, I started to notice that I was different. I stood out. Even though it wasn't expressly said to me, I was the only black girl in my class, the only black girl, I think, in my year group, which is just shocking when I look back. And um, this was really becoming more and more apparent. And as I was growing up, you know, going to secondary school as well, again, I felt like there wasn't many others like me, many other black women, black girls, even black guys around me as well, especially in the area that um, I used to live in. Fast forward moving into the workplace, um, I didn't really experience racism until a couple of years ago. I think it's about, where are we now, four, five years, no, two, I'm, I'm lying to you. It's about six, <laughs> seven years ago um, when I was at a particular job workplace, again, predominantly white colleagues there, and my line manager, who many of you probably heard my story because this is actually what made me want to jump into entrepreneurship and start my own journey. But it really became quite evident that how um, systemic racism is in the workplace. I mean, this was just one woman doing it. So I'm just thinking about larger corporations that have it as part of the ingrained system. And I just felt, you know, at every, every turn, everything I did, never praised for the work I did, never praised for the talent, the gift, what I brought to the workplace in terms of all the wins, etc. And this was very apparent in her behavior, in her words. I really felt it because the thing about racism is that 
yes, it, it can be seen. Many people are very vocal, you know, very um, not shying away from it. But it's also unseen as well. But whether it's the two, seen or unseen, it's felt by the person. And that's what I really want to re reiterate today. It's felt just in your behavior, your language, the way you are around people. It, it just, it screams what your thoughts and feelings are. And that's what I really, you know, felt and endured during that time as well. Even in, you know, today's workplace, it's something that when it comes to um, progression, career progression especially, um, it's something whereby many black people are overlooked, even though that they have the same skills, the same expertise as their white counterparts, they're always overlooked and um, never get those uh, opportunities that they're going to be good matches for. Or if they do, it's just because they have to, you know, it, the, the organization has to tick a box. They have to, um, you know, you're just one of the quota that the organization is fulfilling. And that's very disheartening. As we move into, you know, 2020, we're already midway through 2020, we're in the 21st century, and this is still going on. And it's something that many of us are feeling, Blacks, other uh, ethnic minorities as well, that is becoming really, really apparent and the gap is widening, so it needs to be addressed now. So that's just an overview summary about my journey and experiences of racism. So I'd love to hear yours, Charlotte. As well, yeah, um, it's just great points that you mentioned, particularly in the workplace, which I can identify with. So, I think going back to my journey, um, started a journey experiences of racism started a little earlier. So, um, for context, guys, myself and Grace lived in the same area, um, different parts, um, and where I was based, myself and my family we had what was the equivalent, I would say, for the US citizens of Ku Klux Klan, but we had National Front household that lived at the top of our street. Very blatant, very apparent. The um, Union Jack used to be outside, used to have lots of, it was almost like we feel they was a ground where they was training up recruits because lots of people used to be in and out, the Bulldogs, etc. So it started with myself and my siblings. We used to go out and we was always, um, I was probably, maybe it started from about six years old, very, very young, used to go out and I used to get um, scrutinised, attacked, they used to send the dogs on me. So I always say that this is where my initial fear of dogs came from. I used to have the dogs set on me all the time. Um, my brother used to be targeted being a young black male and my sister as well, who's a bit younger. So it got to a point um, where one day my dad was like, enough is enough, we're not going to be consistently targeted. Went down there thinking he would be able to reason parent to parent with the one of the men of the household. What happened in turn was that actually my dad was actually beaten up very, very violently. Um, we then took it to the police, but because of institutional racism, particularly um, then as well it was all turned a blind eye no one really wanted to hear but this racism for us went on ex in a very extreme circumstance to the point that our lively our lives were actually targeted we used to have fire bombs through the letterbox we used to have um letters coming through saying you're going to be dead we had the dog feces through the letterbox we was targeted none of us could walk on the road it was very very dangerous to the point that we had to be put in a safe house so my um, experience with racism, very, very extreme, traumatic at a young age. I couldn't understand why I had to leave the house that we loved. My parents had worked hard to buy that house. Why we had to leave the house that we loved, move away from my best friend and possibly have to move away from my primary school. But it was because our life was actually literally at, um, you know, really we was being targeted and threatened to be killed, all of us because of the colour of our skin. Um, so we, we experienced very, very extreme racism. We experienced this, um, how hard it can be to have deafening and silence. When we turned on neighbours for, you know, witness statements, etc., because everyone knew what was going on. It was open, it was frank. No one wanted to adhere or say yes because no one wanted to be targeted and everyone was scared of this household. 
again the police they wasn't interested for them you know many of them were racist in themselves that it was institutionalized it has been for a very very long time um, it wasn't until we actually then went on to find lawyers who were for those of you in the UK you may um, remember the Stephen Lawrence case so we ended up getting the same law team as them and we was actually able to meet the parents at that point and I think what sunk in for me because it was a big um, thing in the UK how Stephen Lawrence had got killed was when his parents actually sat down with my brother and said to him you have to be really careful these people will stop at nothing having had their son killed and I think that was how deep and when I realized actually you can be killed for the color of your skin so experience that severe racism for um, my childhood going up to secondary school having to go and um, form a safe house to secondary school then I guess from secondary school for me I was again the only black girl in my year so always knew something was a bit different and obviously we've gone through that experience however say so secondary school um it was predominantly, I was the only black girl in my year, but we had quite a few Asian people in the year. And I think they experienced a bit more racism than I did at second school um, in marginalised to the white community there. So um, at, I think for the first time, I felt like I had some sort of uh, camaraderie in terms with the um, Asian people that was at my school. I think going on later again, experienced it um, later when I had, um, so I opened up the first Caribbean restaurant in the same area that again was predominantly white. It was actually well received. Um, and I think one of the reasons we've talked about this in previous episodes, but I attempt to entre entrepreneurship early, it was because I always knew I didn't want to ever have someone else have the power over me. So I think turning in that way, and then there was an experience at that shop again, where I experienced racism firsthand in terms of, there was an incident in which some people from across the pub had come over to my shop and they'd ended up um, smashing the window. Uh, so I called the police for help, thinking I would be getting help as a business owner, local, you know, um, local business owner. And I also called my brother to come to the shop at the same time, being um, a female at the shop, and I just wanted that security of having another male. The police came and saw my brother and instantly assumed the worst. He was nothing to do with any incident. The incident got out of hand, and they actually physically abused my brother, had him down on the floor, kicking him. Um, all of that there was a number of witnesses my, I had my dad down on the floor as well and um, despite me telling them at eight months pregnant these were my family members they had nothing to do with actually the drunk people that had come from the pub um, that incident turned out very very vile again eight months pregnant and I was pushed against the railings by the police officers um, had to have ambulance called due to the panic and actually that incident could have turned out where my brother could have lost his life I could have lost my baby because of the way that incident was handled by the police due again to institutional racism so firsthand I've experienced it probably in more extreme cases than many but I know it has existed throughout the, my career I've always predominantly been one of the only black people in in, um, in departments where we've worked, where I've worked. So I felt it, as Grace said before, I felt uh, what it is sometimes to be just the token and sometimes to have to work harder and get overlooked for promotions and that when I'm very well qualified. Again, why it's so important for me and why I always tell people that entrepreneurship is a way to freedom is a way to being able to empower yourself as well. So yeah, that's snippets. Obviously, I'm not going into full, but that's snippets of my experiences with racism over the years as a woman in the UK. Yeah, and it's just heartbreaking to listen. You know, Charlotte's really experienced the extreme end of racism. Uh, you know, mine's been sort of been felt in little pockets, but it's, it's been felt. But, you know, at the end of the day, racism exists. It's very large out there. It's endemic, systemic, and ingrained. And I know many workplaces now are moving towards looking at career progression or unconscious bias training. You know, these are all things that should have been there or at the fore of an organization's, um, you know, programs from the very start. But it's a shame that it takes for senseless killings Yes. for us as a world to wake up to what's been going on for so many years. The Black Lives Matter movement is a powerful movement and I do pray that we, we do start to make some real changes. We're already seeing things happen now, but the question is how long will it last? How long do we, will it take the 
till it becomes an afterthought, you know, and that's something that I really want to push forward as an agenda, Charlotte and myself, you know, we're working on a couple of projects, you know, looking ahead as to how we can keep bringing this to the fore because black lives are endangered at the moment. Yeah. Yes, all lives matter, but right now we're being killed by the police, institutional racism, as Charlotte said, for no good reason at all. You know, we're being treated less fairly than our white counterparts, even our Asian counterparts. And when it comes to whatever the race rankings are, we are unfavorably treated. And that's something that we're standing up and rising against. And we've got the support of many white people, many Asian people, that's brilliant. And these protests, are working they are making a change but you know now it's almost like the protests are being diluted in a way because now it's moving in the uk it's moving towards should we keep historic statues that's not what the argument's about no. it's about our lives forget the statues you know everything's being diluted now so we need to come back to the subject matter at hand yeah, absolutely. I agree in terms of, I think from the beginning, a lot of people didn't understand. And I say, if you're in your bubble and this is so far removed from you, actually, no matter what colour you are, you would be blind and oblivious to what's happened. But now it's the time where people are speaking up, sharing stories. I mean, we're even doing a podcast about it right now. So I think it's a perfect opportunity for people now that eyes have been awakened and they can understand what has been going on for years and years and centuries that actually there is time to make real lasting changes and the reason why so many people do not want this message diluted is because we don't want to be returning back here six months later with another death being listed despite being video recorded or not or with another case going towards um you know the disciplinary board of someone experiencing racism because there was no equality and diversity within the workplace so we want to make sure that there's actually a real change and the more we have conversations and talk about this openly no matter how discomforting it's discomforting or hard it is is the more actually we're moving towards change because people can start to understand and actually take a stance and make real last changes and for me it's so important that we start to look at solution focused ways to combat this so that our next generation and we're both you know grace is expecting i've got kids as well we're both gonna um have children and we don't want our children to be exposed experiencing this sort of stuff because we all understand life is hard enough as it is without these additional um you know it is burdens to have to worry about because of the color of your skin you may be targeted you may be passed up you may not be you know a client even potentially in business may choose and not to want to go for you instead of a counterpart not based on ability or experience but based on perceptions of color of skin you know so we want to move past that i think it's Grace and I, we're so aligned and, you know, champion this cause and not just now, but we'll continue to be and have been, hence why we do the work that we do. Um, so it's very, very important for me as well. Yeah, Charlotte's definitely hit the nail on the head. So, yeah, it's all about, as Charlotte said, having the right conversations, discussions, education. So unlearning some of the past things that have been just ingrained into from past generations yeah. and then moving forward and taking action. So there's so much more that Charlotte and I could say on this topic. Obviously, we would love to hear your views. But if you are not a member of our free community over on Facebook, then we encourage you to join where we will keep on with the conversation. We'd love to hear your stance and take on it. And we'll be sharing more snippets of what we're doing, what we're up to, especially looking at the whole racial divide agenda going forward. So the group is the Female Entrepreneur Collective, and we would love to have you in there. Exactly. All right. Make sure you join, guys. So I think we're wrapping it up now. But yes, continue the conversation. You know, share your thoughts and come over to the group and continue partying with us. <laughs> All right then. Have a good one. Take care.